Hello everybody. I occasionally these ties, honestly I do. Um, so uh, the next half an hour, 35, 40 minutes a bit about mastery learning, a sort of concept that's coming in through uh, quite a lot of the educational literature and it's based on some fairly well-established uh, research, educational research and professional performance research in other domains as well as in healthcare. <coughs> And really, this is just to sort of position it in terms of getting us to think about what this might look like in our practice uh, and how it might inform the way in which we support trainees transition from novice to proficient to more expert. Actually, how it might even inform some of us who are the older duffers uh, about learning new skills. Uh, because actually, the way that we've been doing it perhaps has not been... Uh, as efficient or as safe as could be the case when we look at it a bit more objectively. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what you think. Um, I'm leading quite heavily. The expertise on this is actually, in healthcare at least, is actually north of the border. Um, the group who traditionally, historically were uh, involved in putting together quite a lot of the work around non-technical skills for anaesthesia, uh, and in their simulation setup and their work with work psychologists and that they've now moved on and they've been developing quite a lot of work around mastery learning. Not in anaesthetics, it's coming in anaesthetics. Some of the stuff I'll be talking to you about is a bit about what it looks like in surgery, even what it looks like in medicine. Um, and anaesthesia I think is uh, close on the tails of those groups. That work is really based on, as I say, a wealth of literature, which I'm not gonna go through but is based on these two people who particularly have coordinated a great deal of that. Bill McGeagy, who's uh, set up a program around simulation-based learning in Chicago and Northwest Universities, and have been running that program with a very, very methodical educational research basis, looking at impact of simulation-based learning on professional performance and developing the evidence base, some of which I'll touch on today. And the chap on the right, perhaps Rob uh, might be more interested in that, is uh, Anders Eriksson, who's the psychologist who did, has written or been involved in quite a volume of the work looking at development of expert performance. And actually, he wrote all the stuff that Malcolm Gladwell then turned into a multi-million spinner for himself in his popular books around 10,000 Hours. And it's really interesting talking to Anders Ericsson about dismissing what Malcolm Gladwell wrote because he'd misinterpreted some of it. But actually, it, it hit the headlines, didn't it? So two um, quite respected researchers with a life of, uh, uh, of work behind them. And this sort of leans on, on, on that quite, quite an extent. So what should we do? We'll have a little think about the background, some of the evidence and the need, and think about that perhaps in our own context of, of work. I'll try and describe, just outline very briefly what a mastery learning program looks like and some of the components that underpin it in terms of checklists, or yeah, there's checklists, checklists everywhere, but actually how they're put together and actually how we might reach consensus for that and some of the challenges that that brings. And if there's time at the end, we'll perhaps have a few questions about discussion about actually, well, what this might mean for us. Is there appetite for us to look at it? Now, it is an interesting one, right. So uh, we'll start with this. Uh, has anyone heard of, of, of this chap, MacArthur Wheeler? I, I would very imagine you won't have done. So, uh, so there's an interesting bit here uh, about how we imagine or how we perceive or how we judge our own abilities. Um, and uh, this chap in the 90s um, uh, robbed some banks. He robbed some banks. And he was quite surprised when at tea time, on the day that he'd robbed the banks, the police came knocking at his door and said, uh, we're going to arrest you for robbing these banks. And he said, well, how could you, how do you possibly know it's me? And he said, well, we've got you on the security cameras. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, how did you know it's me? Well, you're on the security cameras. Yeah, but how did you recognise me? And it transpired, this bloke, had read about lemon juice acting as invisible ink. <laughs> and what he'd done 
was he basically smeared lemon juice all over his face on the basis that therefore he would be invisible to the cameras. So a very, very interesting concept, isn't it? Now, I've worked with people like this, so don't, you know, you know. I, and it's interesting. So Dunning and Kruger, two psychologists that looked into this and actually started doing quite a lot of research, actually, when psychologists could do real work on sort of testing us as, you know, animals. And actually started thinking, well, actually, what does this mean about our innate ability to judge our competence at doing a task? And they said, well, it's quite interesting because actually there's quite a lot of evidence that says now, actually, when you are uh, relatively, shall we say, early in your learning... There are times when actually you sort of get a bit more confident, don't you? And uh, we have a bit of an inherent overestimation of our ability to apply our skills under different circumstances. Until we fall flat on our face. And then we think, ooh, what happened there? I didn't like that very much. When you are more proficient and more expert, sometimes actually we underestimate our abilities to cope and apply that into different contexts. Uh, it's just the human nature. It's not, you know, don't take it personally. It's the human nature. And they, they describe this as this, this sort of Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's really interesting when you think about this. Um, because uh, it's, uh, just, uh, it's just a common truth. Now, I'm not saying that those abilities overlap. But actually, there is something about how we learn, how we self-regulate uh, and develop our abilities. And, and there's a spectrum here. Some people are more confident in their uh, uh, desire to have a go at doing things than others, that's fair enough. Some people are a little bit more cautious. But they tested this out under all sorts of domains, all sorts of groups, and came up with relatively consistent findings. So they said, well, there's something about actually how do we do it? And the problem is, is that our ability to self-regulate, our ability to self-judge what our performance is likely to be, is not quite as reliable as we might like it to be. So there's something for us to think about there. Something for us to think about. And actually, the mastery learning bit sort of leans on that many years later to say, well, actually then, the way that we help ourselves, help colleagues, develop competence through to proficiency could perhaps be looked at in a slightly more robust way. And that's what's behind a mastery learning approach rather than perhaps the more traditional approaches of, well, you've given it a go a few times, you seem OK, off you go. Let us know if you're worried. And of course, the problem is some people won't know when they should be worried. And some people worry all the time. So they're ringing you off all the time. And you think, oh, this is really tedious. So there's, there's something for us to be a little bit more objective about it. And of course, there's a broader argument than that, isn't there? Because actually, there's a sort of patient safety case. So actually, if we think about particular skills, procedures, tasks that we're involved in or that colleagues in other specialties are involved in, we know that there are times when those procedures get delayed or whether they're perhaps not done with an outcome that we would hope for. And occasionally that might be because that person doing it, their preparation for doing it has not been quite as optimal as it could have been. There's the whole productivity thing. Oh, I can't get the drip in. What do you do? Oh, ring up the third on. Right, I've got quite a lot of work to do at the moment. But actually sometimes we find ourselves increasingly assisting colleagues in other specialties perform tasks and skills because actually, for whatever reason, the trainees in that area of practice have not been appropriately prepared to develop that capability or they've de-skilled. Or interestingly, some of the people who would be supervising them in practice have certainly de-skilled. So there's a bit of a gap there. And a default mechanism, it feels as though a default mechanism, one of the default mechanisms is this room. You are the support mechanism for this. <coughs> Book it as an emergency for lumbar punctures, for advanced vascular access, for other forms of pain relief that we might get involved in. You'll, you'll know your own examples. And there's certainly an educational case in terms of actually how we make most efficient or perhaps most optimal use of the resources and the skills we've got to really prepare people for that transition to practice with distant supervision, with, without supervision, independent practice, on making it an outcomes-based programme 
rather than a time-based program of actually, well, it's time for you to go up to the next level, or now you're going to start doing your OBS because you've done two years in this role. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So let's have a think about then actually the, 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 the what is involved in terms of how we acquire skills and actually how we demonstrate, uh, have an outcomes-based approach to that and actually how we support or perhaps acknowledge that some of us work at different speeds in terms of acquiring those skills or learning about their application in different contexts and how can we do that in a way which hopefully is not just effective but hopefully is relatively efficient and certainly is reliable. The GMC are on this, they're fairly clear that actually this is part of the duties that we should be supporting for trainees. I think it extends beyond trainees, I think um, those of us that have been in practice for, for a while will we'll, we'll constantly be challenged by new techniques, new approaches to practice which we need to absorb, we need to think about actually how do we develop those capabilities and that can be challenging. I rely on you, the trainees, a lot. I might rely on colleagues a lot, but actually the opportunity to develop and acquire these skills to a level of capability, which means actually I'm pretty comfortable about this, is really important. Now I might have slightly broader view about being clear about where my limitations are, but actually bear in mind, man with lemon juice, I might not pick that up, I might get caught out. What does that look like? Well, not great as a department, not great for me as a professional, uh, not great if, uh, God forbid, this group get involved. You think, well, why did you try that? Because it looks obvious afterwards, you know, if an M&M &M meeting, blindingly obvious, everyone in the room is an expert at an M&M &M meeting, aren't they? Not at the time, though, when most of them weren't available. <laughs> right, so here's some work out in medicine then, actually. Um, they looked at this for, for medicine in, in Scotland, and uh, this is some, a little bit of their data, really, to lean on, because I'm not quite sure what we've got data like this in anaesthetics at the moment. But they looked at some of the curricula, and they said, well, actually, there are some skills there that are deemed as essential, whatever that means. Uh, some are desirable. It feels to me as if, in medicine, quite a lot of the skills in the essential column are drifting over to the right. Uh, and actually, we're sort of absorbing that space quite comfortably. But that's where it is. But they then asked trainees, OK, well, actually, look, if, if that is the case, we're meant to be sort of training you to develop a level of competence, proficiency, whatever, in these, well, you know, what gets in the way? And actually, this might be more common to our world as well, actually. So they looked at, well, where are the barriers to actually developing these skill sets and demonstrating level of proficiency in a safe way? So actually, the clinical opportunities, the opportunity to do that in practice become squeezed. We know that both in terms of time spent in the clinical environment, the opportunities that are afforded in the clinical environment, <coughs> the confidence of others to supervise somebody in the clinical environment, quite interesting, can be quite a challenge. Um, just generally being too busy. The access to appropriate levels of training in a professional manner, again, a challenge, a challenge for all of us. You'll have your own views about this. The, extent to which and the quality with which supervision is offered and is that reliable and consistent or does it vary? I suspect it varies a bit. Conflicting guidance. It's quite interesting I'll tell the story about us trying to set some of this up with medicine here. How many different opinions were there about how to put a chest strain in? Oh my god. We aren't there yet. We've been working on it for three years. But uh, then finally it just comes down to those personal attributes but actually those weren't the big hitters it was more about the learning environment the training environment the support afforded and how it was structured and the mastery learning piece sort of takes, in, takes that into account so what, what could or should this look like well you, you tell me I mean I, there's something here that says well actually if you sat back and look at what we should be offering as a programme there's something about how we offer supervised learning using a validated safe methodologies. And some of that is certainly now simulation based, not for everything, but actually increasingly there are opportunities using a <coughs> simulated based approach that can actually really underpin our development of skills in, in, in ourselves. And actually optimizing access to those resources as well. And those resources might not be, I'm not saying actually it's in the sim center, I think a lot of this now is in the workplace. Um, and available sort of, you know, in the training rooms and stuff like that. And we just need to be smart about actually how to make that access accessible. There's about actually enabling this approach to have a risk-free approach to achieving competency. 
before you get to do it in practice. That's really interesting. We just published a simulation strategy for the College of Anesthetists. So we're, we're making a move. So the patient perspective on this <laughs> might not be the same as yours or mine about what is acceptable. We may do with how we do stuff for quite a long time. This is positioning, well, actually, what could that look like? Actually, if you get this right, then actually that approach to developing a level of ability in a learning environment and how that is supported in its transition to practice, how that can accelerate the transition to practice and the development of uh, those skills with different degrees of supervision or understanding its application in different contexts when actually... Uh, the skill, the application of that skill might be more challenged actually becomes a reality then actually now we can actually have supervision which is more consistent and more reliable and the supervision could actually be based on what we know your abilities are, my abilities are in a non-clinical environment so we know what the platform is we know what you've got to before we start having a go at doing it in practice the work was done here by Tim Draycott, and she was an Obson Guiney consultant, actually, and he did loads of work on safe births in Bristol. And one of the programmes he did was around this, was around for um, uh, gynaecology surgeons, actually, and the trainees, and the senior trainees doing some of the gynaecology oncology work, which is quite, quite complex stuff, laparoscopic as well. And um, he was looking at two sets of trainees, one of whom had been through quite an intense simulation-based preparation program for that skill set in practice where they wanted to get supervised practice another who'd gone through a traditional scheme and he, he talked to the trainees and he measured all this sort of stuff and he said well actually what happens and actually he was a bit confused because the data that came back said well the trainees that have been through the simulated program to enhance their preparation for that got more supervision in practice he said well that doesn't make sense does it really because actually they should need less but of course what was happening was the trainees who hadn't been through that programme were getting to a certain point in a particular procedure, which was then for quite a complex bit. And the supervisor, the consultant, was saying, oh, it's all right, I'll take over here, I'll do this bit, you can do the next one. So they took over. The people who'd been through the preparatory programme were actually allowed to go through that more complex part because the supervisor was prepared to supervise them. Because they knew what they were likely to do and what the steps were. They knew they'd got that. So they could have a different conversation with them about uh, the feedback on what to do next. So it's quite interesting, actually, how it enhanced that transition to more proficient or expert practice. And actually, perhaps this is something which we should just be doing more day-to-day -day in terms of our everyday practice about new skills, even for us who are a bit more uh, long in the tooth. So what does it look like? Well, actually, so there's, there's, there is a process to it. There's some bits here which actually I'll go through, I'll touch on, um, uh, to give you a flavour of actually what's included within a mastery learning programme and um, some of the bits where actually it's a problem. The first bit, and it can be quite tricky, as I touched on already, standardising. So actually knowing what the standard is that you're meant to achieve for a particular task or a skill. And to a certain extent in anaesthetics, we've got this in terms of uh, some of our, our um, sort of assessment methodologies, but perhaps not quite as tight as we would like, and we're probably not quite as consistent about how it's applied uh, or how it's uh, observed and what the assessment process is for this. But there's a bit about having a standardised, this is the level you're meant to achieve to go on to the next stage in the development of this skill or procedure or bit of work. You have to let people know what that is. It's not a secret, right? Actually, well, you know, we're not going to tell you what you're meant to do. We're going to see how you get on. No, this is it. Have a look at it. Make sure you understand it. Because if, if the, the trainee or if the person trying to aspire to this level doesn't understand what that means, well, you've got a bit of work to do there to, to help them understand. And then you can work towards achieving it. Then there's this bit about assessment and actually formative assessment and feedback before you reach this piece and then go on to, hopefully, be better able to perform under supervision. So it's actually, well, that sort of sounds like, oh, God, Christ, there's a lot of work, isn't it? But it's not really, if you get it right. Evidence, I touched on this. There's some great stuff out there. Some there, well, Malcolm Gladwell is on there, isn't he? Some easier to read than others. But actually, there is, there's just acres of evidence about actually how this has been built up, where it comes from. 
there are some publications in the healthcare sector which speak to this approach and how it's been applied in some groups, but applied in a consistent and a reliable fashion and a longitudinal fashion over time not just dipped into and dipped out of, and actually, well, we thought we gave it a go, it was a bit tricky, we stopped doing it. Well, there's no evidence that it works. Well, no, we didn't really commit to it, did you? So this is a bit, some of that bit work, you'd probably be much more familiar around CVC, catheter insertion, stuff like that. The mastery learning bit was part of that package. The blue line just demonstrates the post-intervention performance in terms of infections, I think is up on the X curve. The review of evidence has been pulled together by McGeagy's group and others across different interventions over time. And yes, it is starting to demonstrate changes, not just in ability to perform a task, but actually what that means in terms of patient care and the outcomes and a broader agenda around actually productivity within a particular system. It works across domains. So here's some data within surgery, like I said, some surgical data that they've collected from various places looking at what well, time but actually also looking at complications of doing procedures and actually preparation for that procedure and the transition of being able to do that more effectively whether you might i'm not sure measuring it by time is a really great marker but actually in terms of complications and in terms of the um, other markers on performing that task in practice and this is an interesting one about boot camps so you've not heard about boot camps but actually these are uh, being put in place now across surgery and across medicine and probably in anaesthetics in Scotland now to look at actually well if you take a cadre of novices and we will put them through what will we do here sort of uh, I don't know sort of a three months program isn't it and stuff like that you progress through that and at the end of it hopefully you start going on to the on-call rotor if you if you're deemed ready but actually the boot camp approach says well actually there's probably an opportunity for us to really intensify front load that simulation based piece to de level, develop a level of <coughs> capability in that domain to then really enhance your learning in practice. So actually your opportunity then to develop and perform these skills under consistent reliable supervision to develop that ability to work without supervision is actually accelerated. So there's an interesting trade-off there. So not only are we probably accelerating the ability of individuals to develop practice skills that require less supervision, we're probably doing it in a way which is more reliable and safer to the patients. What does it look like? Well, there's various bits and bobs here uh, about putting it all together, and I'll, I'll, I'll just shoot through these. So this sort of traditional model, actually, isn't it, about how we learn? Well, you, you, you demonstrate your ability to, to do something against, um, I don't know, adopts or something like that, and we'll give you a little bit of feedback, and then you have another go. You have another go with someone else, probably. Uh, in two days and they don't quite know what feedback you got last time and uh, you haven't necessarily quite assimilated what it is you need to do differently so you're saying well actually yeah, I've, I've got to can I can can you watch me I've, I you know I've, I've got to get signed off I've got to get signed off I mean that's the outcome isn't it I've got to get signed off How many medical students coming into the anesthetic room who are you I'm the medical student all oh, right yeah, what do you want oh I wonder if you could sign me off on a catheterization I go what I said, well, you know, have you met the patient? No. Oh, anyway. <laughs> I like quiet face. Right. So the feedback bit's really important. So feedback's got to be against a consistent standard. So the learner's got to know the standard. The observer, facilitator's got to know the standard. And the feedback's got to be geared to that, such that everybody understands what it is you need to do to achieve uh, passing at that level before you then go on to build that up if it's a task that needs to be built up into a more complex sequence or to go and practice it in a different area or a different uh, context. It involves these one-on-one -on -one sessions and some expertise around that feedback. Now we've got expertise, but actually it's just distributed everywhere and we don't necessarily always put it together in a way which is more consistent. We don't necessarily check that actually we're all providing that feedback against the same set of standards. So it's a bit confusing, I'd imagine, for trainees sometimes. We don't always do it in a safe, protected environment because we say, well, it's a bit difficult to get to that. And I think we can do something about changing that, quite honestly. Um, and we don't necessarily have the standardised checklist approach to doing it, which actually is a bit of a thing. So for, le for learners, for trainees, novices to come through this programme, or me, actually, well, you need to be prepared for it, so you need to know what it is you're trying to do. 
and have that knowledge base and actually be able to do it. You need to be able to have a chance to actually have a look at it and get a feel for the sequence and what's involved and the kit and stuff like that before you then come into this sort of mastery session to actually have a go at practicing it under supervision. And your feedback then comes back to this checklist, which you've already seen and you've had a look at it. Hopefully that is consistent and hopefully that allows you, if it takes you a few times or three days or whatever, hopes it gets you through to that point where actually you're ready to move on to the next stage. So it's done in a very consistent way and it's done to a particular outcome. And that outcome might be a bit harder than we currently expect because the standard is clearly set and it's put into a structure. It deals with the whole aptitude piece by saying, well, actually, we're now saying we're going to take a more professional view of both your attitudes and your willingness to go through this program, our willingness to offer it and provide it, where are the opportunities, how do we get that, how do we structure this so it's available. We'll look at the quality of the facilitators and of the instructions so that actually we're more consistent. And we'll just check that you understand what it is you've got to achieve rather than make it a secret squirrel. Oh no, I don't do it like that. I've got my special left hand under curve ball. I always, I always play that at this stage. All oh, right, I'm a learner. Well, they don't need that, do they? You know, nobody needs that. Anyway, so actually, so actually we accept the fact that actually it's the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And the outcome can be a little bit uh, tougher but clear to the person who's developing the skill. The time taken to get it is fine, whatever. Have three goes, have 30 goes, but at least we know what you're trying to do. You're trying to improve that based on really objective feedback. And actually what we're trying to achieve is that outcome, that achievement, not to have that sort of normal curve where most people get it. You're saying, well, let's just shift that to the right. Actually the outcome is much, much clearer. It's tougher, it's further over to the right. It might take some people a bit longer to get that than others, it's okay. As long as you're demonstrating a willingness, you're committed and motivated to develop and improve, and we can support the opportunities for deliberate practice with feedback. And that is actually what underpins expert practice. Under all domains, whether you're a violinist or an anaesthetist or a surgeon, it is a bit about the deliberate practice and feedback. I suspect what happens is that for some of us, actually, we get to a level and we plateau. So we don't necessarily apply ourselves or have opportunity to think about where are the bits of improvement or we do it but actually you know we get tired or less energy for that at times than others so actually that is what is under the in the expert practice literature and the checklist bit is really interesting so I touched on this bit earlier about actually getting physicians so we try to get a group of physicians to agree how to put chest strain in clearly a waste of time uh, we couldn't even we certainly couldn't get them to talk about how to put a central line in because actually, none of them could. Ah, there we are. What do they do? Oh, we thought you could do that. All right, thanks very much. So actually, um, it's about actually having a think about the tasks that we do. And now those of us that, once you get used to doing a task, of course, you forget about how you're doing it. Because um, you just do it. So actually, it's really interesting because actually there's a little bit of human factors in here about actually task and task breakdown. To really understand the sequence of bits that underpin how a task is performed. And some of those are sequential, they have to be A before B, some of them are done in parallel, and some of them are more important or less important under different contexts. So it actually really starts to allow you to look at a task in much greater detail than perhaps we do, because we think, well, that's all right, central line, I'll give it a go. Oh, I've got to do this on the left-hand side. Have you done that before? No, but it'll be all right. Ooh, here we go. Uh, so actually you can break it down a little bit more objectively than that a little bit more objectively and we can describe it in a way which is observable and accessible and actually it makes sense to both the trainee and the trainer, the learner and the facilitator, whoever that is. And actually that can be trialled. So we can ensure that actually you can reach consensus on this. We could probably, if we put the effort in, we could do it. It's achievable. And we can agree, well, what is the minimum standard that we would like in this department? What is the minimum standard which the college would like? I don't know. There are various sort of assessment metrics that actually enable us to do that. Um, we can actually agree what the standard is and actually sign up to it and say, okay, well, let's work towards that, even if that has to be adapted. So that actually that session then becomes much more uh, transparent and clear to the people taking part in it. And then you've got to put it together into a bit of a programme. 
So this is where we need help from educational leaders, department leaders, all in the room. Because actually we have to be clear about, well actually, is this something which we're willing to invest in and actually do? Because we can see that there are some benefits and actually if we do that, then fair enough, we need to measure and demonstrate those benefits are achieved. Because actually it's more than just the checklist. It's actually doing this in an integrated fashion, in a consistent fashion across the department. It's having the people involved with the right skills to be able to do it, some of the resources we need to support it. It's thinking about how learners, all grades, would access that, what those training opportunities are to make sure that it's actually easily accessible and some would need access to it more than others and that's fine. Then you get into the bit about whether you're making a difference and you can measure that at all sorts of different levels. There's plenty of literature which is describing evidence at those higher levels now so I think this is starting to move away from uh, a nice to have to saying, well, perhaps it's something we should be thinking about a little bit harder and work out what the steps are for us to do this a little bit more consistently. And the commitment then is perhaps at a department level or at a school level uh, for the trainees or at a department level, even for those of us who need to learn new skills. Because the evidence is out there. There are challenges. Challenges about consensus. Very interesting. We haven't achieved that with medics. So there is a bit of a problem. We need to think about that, work our way through it. There's a bit about buy-in, that leadership bit, and you know, how do we fit this into what is already a very busy world? Time is a challenge. But none of these things are beyond the wit of man. If you think, well, actually, the investment up front is worth it down, downstream. The problem is, is that we have a very immediate sort of sense of feedback and gratitude to say, actually, well, I want to see, I want to see impact now. And actually, you might see impact on this in a longitudinal fashion if we invest in this and do it month by month by month, year on year on year, in three years' time, it'd be very different. But that's the time scale that we have to aim for if this appeals. Because actually, I think this, the evidence is there. The resources are here and with some of the facilities we've got available to us. So really, I think the direction that this goes in is up to us as a department and as a school uh, to see whether there's appetite and uh, sort of motivation to help make it happen. And whether we start off with um, novices coming into the programme, whether we build it into looking at trainees progressing through different stages around particular skills, uh, you know, the opportunity is there. That's it. Thank you very much.